show dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who believe the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode is brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I am joined by the one and only Dr. Judith Orloff, who is a New York Times bestselling author of the Empath Survival Guide. She is a psychiatrist, an empath herself, and is a member of the UCLA Psychiatric Clinical Faculty. By synthesizing the pearls of traditional medicine with cutting edge knowledge of intuition, energy, and spirituality, Dr. Olaf also specializes in treating highly sensitive, empathic people in her private practice. Her work has been featured on The Today Show and CNN, in The Oprah Magazine, and in The New York Times. Welcome so much to the show, Dr. Orloff. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Great. And I'm going to call you Judith for the rest of the conversation, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Great. So I know that your latest work is Affirmations for Empaths. It just came out last week. Would you hold it up for, yes, congratulations. And you gave me a, a sneak peek actually in preparation for this conversation. And I read it and I thought, oh, I know how many people I'm gonna buy this book for. Um, you wrote in the introduction, I'm gonna just repeat your words back to you here. As a psychiatrist, I know how vital it is to heal emotional wounds with the proper therapeutic support. However, I also realize that much of suffering is amplified by a lack of self-love. So can you tell us more about your new journal and what you hope readers, how they'll use it? Well, I've always loved affirmations um, because they help to reprogram your mind and create something more positive that goes down into your subconscious through the practice of repetition. Repetition can be very powerful if it's positive. It also can be powerful if it's negative. You know, as we're seeing, if you keep repeating the same, same, wrong, negative thing over and over again, you start to believe it. It's just the nature of the brain, you know, and, and so you don't want to do that. But when you repeat the positives, you know, you want to repeat whatever the situation, I know I can rely on my inner guidance to find the best solution. So powerful. But that's as opposed to, oh, my God, I don't know what to do. You know, one friend said this, one friend says that. I don't know what I feel. I'm split 50-50. Then you go back to this. That's the mind, by the way. And this book helps you get into your heart. Whatever the situation, I know I can rely on my inner guidance to find the best solution. So if you repeat that at least three times a day in a very gentle way, uh, you begin the programming process and you begin to focus more on that than, fo than focusing on all your confusion and second guessing of yourself. And so in the book, each affirmation you get to work and play with for a week. And there's lined paper that I love lined paper in journals and there are questions, prompts, what is, why is this affirmation important to me? Um, how can I apply this affirmation in my life? And, you know, I want to say there's an audio program as well that's a companion to the book where I go kind of deep, more deeper into the audio prompts for each affirmation and why we as sensitive people need to have affirmations and why this affirmation is important. So, you know, it's meant to listen and write. <laughs> so, <laughs> which I think is brilliant. Um, you listen to my speaking about the affirmation and then it's your week to write, but it's about also noticing the luxury of time and how you want to spend your time. And for me, and I know you too, empathy is the way we want to spend our time because we really find that to be extremely valuable. I think it's the most valuable trait in a human being. And I think it can help save the world. So I feel as you do very, very strongly about it. You see, and there are different ways to bring empathy in your life. This affirmation way is a simple way, susceptibly simple. It's not heavy. It's not, mm, I have to do this. I have to do that. You don't. You have to do, just say one affirmation. I grow emotionally as I let resentments go. 
and become free from the residue of past hurts. You know, mm -hmm. is that important to you? Now, if you're a sensitive, empathic person, most likely you're dealing with exhaustion because you're so open and you're so caring and there's so much going on in the world that if you just keep taking it on, that's not going to further your physical or emotional health. It just isn't. And so an affirmation like this, I grow emotionally as I let resentments go and become free from the residue of past hurts. That's powerful to me because it says, as I age, I don't want to just be a pile of resentments that are building up in my being and carrying bitterness around. It's not who I want to be. And so with affirmations, it gives you a choice of, you know, do I want to let go of this resentment? And what does that mean? That's a whole discussion of you don't necessarily forgive the actor or the one who did the terrible act, but you forgive the suffering behind the act, which is the empathy part. You know, and once you do that, you're not as connected to it. So you're freed from the resentment. It's tricky, but it works. And I can imagine how powerful these kinds of affirmations are to repeat and then to journal about it. I can imagine you doing it on on your own or maybe like mother and child or or friends getting together and having like a 10 minute, 15 minute Zoom call, uh, you know, or or, you know, at the end of the week sharing, like I can imagine how many applications this journal could come in handy. But I want to circle back to something that you said earlier, because I think a lot of people still perceive affirmations as sort of like, you know, positive self-talk, but there's real neuroscience, you know, around brain plasticity that you can't deny. So could you speak to why affirmations at a brain level matter? Well, affirmations at a brain level get all the, the neurochemicals you want to be going up and increasing. You want that you activate them. You activate the endorphins. You activate the feel-good neurochemicals, the pain relievers, and you even activate oxytocin um, because that's the bonding hormone. So in Affirmations for empaths, you're bonding with yourself, you're bonding with others, you're bonding with nature. You know, I, I think bonding is very important when it comes to empathy, now, especially empaths who are very sensitive people who are emotional sponges and tend to take on the energy of the world. You want to be with people who are positive and loving and non-judgmental and who can see you and be with you and give you space just to run and fly and be yourself. All right, all of that affirmations can facilitate because that's the point of them, to get you to that place. And so the brain loves affirmations. The brain does not love stress. Um, it does not love it when your serotonin is depleted, the national antidepressant, because then you feel depressed and irritable and no stamina and no patience. You don't want any of that. You want to build up the neurochemicals that are positive that affirmations can do. And when you have the stress or when you have lots of adversity coming at you, the affirmations can help balance your neurochemistry and your mind you know, and your heart and bring you back to your heart. As people get into trouble, when they just stay in their minds all the time, you want to balance your mind and you want to balance your heart. You know, And the affirmations can get you back into your heart at the same time appealing to the mind's logic. So it hits both parts, but what you don't want to do is just stay in your mind, especially if you're going through adversity, especially if you're wanting to develop empathy, as the mind can be a torture chamber and the mind doesn't have all the answers. And if you keep looking to the mind, well, what should I do? Should I make another column? Should I make a pros and cons list? I still don't know what to do. I'm so confused. You get to that point. You have to go to some other place than the mind because you're getting nowhere. Sometimes you get nowhere on the problem level. So then you go into your heart. You take a book like this. You look at it. Hmm, pretty open, you know, just, you could just do it intuitively. What's my, what's my reading today? I learn, isn't this interesting? 
Anita, I learned from the challenge of, of adversity to be especially tender and compassionate with myself during stressful times. Mm -hmm. You see, so that's the exact perfect affirmation for what I was just talking about. How do you deal with adversity? How do you stay in your empathy and your heart? I learned, it's just so simple, it's deceptive. For I can tools out there, just don't please, you know, open up the simplicity door in your brain to allow it in. And I imagine anybody who's in, you know, I call them the empathy superheroes, but everybody who's on the front line of health care delivery uh, or service of some sort, teachers, humanitarians, all of them need to find ways to recharge their batteries because there's so much output. And this sounds like a, a really incredible um, gift for wellness. I really sense that it's a gift for wellness. So thanks for making that contribution. I want to ask a question, Judith. Um, just to take us back to the origin story there, you know, you've got things on a continuum as far as I can tell from, from the material that I've seen, uh, like Google talks, for example, I can include a link below is that you've got, you know, people who are em empathic, right? I consider myself an empathic person. Then there's the highly sensitive person. And I'd really like you to differentiate. And then there's the empath. So could you just at a baseline, share what the three categories are about? Yeah, so I've written about empathy as a spectrum. In the middle of the spectrum, you have beautiful, ordinary, empathic, I mean ordinary in the most illuminated way, you know, ordinary empathy. You, A friend goes through a breakup, your heart goes out to them. You know, a friend goes through a happy time, you know, has a baby born, you're like, oh, you know, I, I feel you. I'm so happy for you. So there's a resonance and your mirror neuron system is connecting to their mirror neuron system. And you're it's you're attaching in a very positive way. You're connecting. And, and that's a, that's in the midline of the empathic spectrum. Um, then if you go up a little bit uh, in terms of sensitivity levels, you have the highly sensitive person. And that's somebody who's very, very sensitive to noise, smells, sounds, scents, um, and all kinds of sensory input. Um, and so they have a, a, an extreme sensitivity to that with a loving heart. And they tend to get exhausted, overwhelmed, go on sensory overload. Um, and they and, and you know and in school unfortunately they're often called sissies or crybabies or you know they're bullied it's because they're not you know especially the guys you know the, you know they want to go walk in the woods they don't want to you know go and do video games all day and be stuck in a device that isn't what they want to do it's just a different different format of, of life they're just you know different different mold and so they're the next link up and then the final link up is the empath, and that's something I am. I don't know if you are. We haven't shared about that. But I've been an empath since I've been a child. No? I don't, I don't think so. No. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but an empath is has everything that the, the middle spectrum has and the highly sensitive person has. But in addition, they have these almost tentacles and the sensitivities that – it's like you pick up something with five fingers and it's like you're feeling with 50 fingers. It's this extreme sensitivity to life, to energy, to movement, to love, or incredibly intuitively tuned in, interested in the spiritual existence of life, connect to nature most of all, prefer one-to-one -one kind of interactions like this rather than a group. if we were with a group of 10, I would prefer this because I like connecting. Um, uh, but empaths tend to go on sensory overload and they take on too much and they don't have boundaries and they don't know how to say no. Um, and so part of the skill set that I teach in the empath survival guide is how do you be a well-balanced empath where you could maximize all your gifts, all your intuitions, all your love for humanity, all of your love of animals and plants and little rabbits hopping in the forest. And, you know, we love them so much, you know, really a lot, <laughs> you know, whereas I don't know if any other people would love them that much, but we really, they feel like they're our family, you know, that all the creatures and it's just, just how we are. Um, so 
you have that whole group, but the empaths need to learn how to set boundaries, you know how to not take on the suffering of the world because that's not a healthy way to go. Is I, I want all the healthcare practitioners out there, all the healers, all the people of service, you need to be in good shape. And if you're an empath, you're a highly sensitive person, you need to learn some of the skills to set boundaries, come back to yourself and not absorb the suffering of the world and give up some of your judgments so you can begin to practice empathy in all kinds of situations to begin to transform them. You know, that's that's the goal of all this. And I just want to say at the bottom of the spectrum, you have, you know, the, the narcissistic personality disorders, you have the sociopaths, you have the psychopaths, and these are people with empathy deficient disorders. I mean, these people, this is so hard for empaths and sensitive people to grasp. They don't feel empathy for you like a normal person. They're not wired that way. You know, for whatever reason, genetically, you know, they're thought that some some traits like um, aggrandizement and entitlement are actually um, transmitted genetically, you know, and that some psychopaths, don't have the autonomic nervous system response that we have to things. So mm-hmm. they're wired differently. And you know, there's a chapter I have in my book, uh, The Empath Survival Guide on the Toxic Attraction Between Empaths and Narcissists. As it's so common as the narcissists, the ones with no empathy and the big seductive manipulators, I mean, really crazy seductive and likable at times, likable, seductive, at least at first, until you don't do it what they want. And then they change their personality. You have to do what they want to get all the good stuff from them. But once you deviate, then they become cold, withholding, punishing, gaslight, love bomb, hover, do all kinds of things. Um, But it's good for everybody to know that there is a variation of empathy in different people. And not everyone is wired the same way. So in your adventures in life, you need to you know, look at people like that. You know, does this person have empathy? You know, and if they do, fine. If they don't, and you need to stay in the situation, then you have certain strategies, and you need to lower your expectations and accept the person as they are. You know, like a boss, if you have a, a narcissistic boss who lacks empathy and you don't want to leave your job, what do you do? You know, so you have to learn strategy. So I'm very strategy oriented. And um, I also uh, love to take empathy to new new areas. And I know this might be what you're working on too, is how do you have empathy in the most extreme situations where there is no rational reason you would want to have empathy for somebody who doesn't deserve it? Why would you ever want to do that? You know, that's the big question, you know. And the, the, the answer is if you want to transform the world, this is how to do it. You have to start with yourself. And it, it, it's not something the mind wants to do. The ego is not wanting to have empathy for, let's say, your husband or, or wife who's the narcissist and took you for all your money and you know just discarded you. Why in the world would you want to have any empathy, at least for the suffering behind this, this creepy person's actions? You know, Why? Because it'll free you, you know, and you're only going to know that if you do this, because it sounds a little theoretical, but I'm telling you, the minute you can say, oh, my God, you know, they, they're they miserable, wretches of people. I pity them. I pity these people who can't see any glimmer of the beautiful heart in others. I pity them. I feel sorry for them. And, you know, I'm so sorry that they have to be so limited. You know, when when you get to that place, you won't be thinking and obsessing about that person for the next 20 years if you can get to that place because Mm. it frees you. If you can get to that place, you don't, you don't uh, forgive them for embezzling all your money or stealing or, you know, the sociopathic things that happen, you know, the Ponzi schemes and all the, the financial oriented bad behaviors that sociopaths do you know you you don't forgive that but you forgive the the humanity under it you separate the person from the act which is very hard and the mind has all kinds of opinions about this you know it's a complex topic and if you're listening and you don't want to do it don't do it this isn't an exercise for everybody but for me 
I want to do this. I want to know about this because this is the secret of the universe. And it goes against certain instincts to have empathy for the un unlovable and the unforgivable. But you don't have empathy for, for the person and you don't make them your best friend or have them in your life. You're just searching, searching, searching for a way to connect, to have empathy for the dark part of human nature. Um, mm -hmm. Because we all have it. From my point of view, we as human beings have the same package, have the genetic propensity to have darkness and light in us. And our freedom comes from being aware of what we're capable of. You know, we're capable of great love and we're capable of great mayhem, whether you want to see it or not. A lot of people don't like to see it. They don't mm. like saying, oh, that's not me. Mm. Of course it's you. It's everyone, simply because you're human. So it's a, quite an exciting discussion, but I think it will lead you know, the empathy discussion in terms of the greater world, in terms of the workplace, in terms of, you know, some practical, uh, the family um, it can lead to some really unsuspecting ways of dealing with impossible situations. Mm -hmm. So that interests me, and it deeply interests me. Today's episode was brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. And so I think, I mean, you're you're the perfect person to actually be talking about this and to be you know an authority on this because you describe yourself as an empath so you have lived experience and you've studied the mind as you know as a trained professional and academic um, I'm just wondering if you would share a little bit of the backstory like what came first is it that you were an empath that's why you went into uh, the studies that you pursued or as a result you put two and two together and understood that maybe you could develop strategies like I'm just curious uh, about yeah, that's an interesting question. That putting two and two together didn't happen until later on in life. But when I was a child, I was an only child. I have two physician parents. I have 25 physicians in my family. And I was a little empathic girl with such sensitivities, you know, and this is so sensitive. I couldn't go into the shopping mall because I'd go in feeling fine and walk out exhausted or sick or anxious and now, I didn't realize I was picking up all the uh, energy in the shopping mall. I was, because I'm a sponge and I didn't have any tools, I was taking in my little body, you know, and, and nobody knew what was happening. I told my parents and they said, oh, dear, you just don't have a thick enough skin. You no, know, no, you know, you have to get tougher. And that never made any sense to me. It just made me feel like there was something wrong with me that I needed to be ashamed of. Mm. So I grew up with a lot of shame. Um, I didn't know what was going on. And uh, this is in my first book, Second Sight. I talk about my journey. Now, how, how in the world did I come to be a psychiatrist, you know, coming from, you know, my, my background? And, and how do I incorporate all of my empathic knowledge with all of my conventional psychiatric skills, you know, which is all very important to be able to blend them all together, use everything, all kinds of wisdom schools together in this life to try and make sense out of this place and make it a better place, you know, and, and personally to make our lives more enjoyable and better through this kind of understanding. Um, but it's kind of a, a path, life path where, you know, I got very heavily involved, involved with drugs in the 60s to run away from my abilities and squash them and, um you know, my parents and I went over a cliff in a car up in Topanga Canyon where I should have died and I didn't. And my parents then forced me to go see a psychiatrist at that time, who was my savior, my beloved first psychiatrist. I really believe in therapy. <laughs> it's good. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, but um, he was my first psychiatrist, and I was so rebellious. I was at war with my family, at war with my parents, you know, just at war, um, rebellion. And, and he says, you know, if, if you want to heal from this, if you want to be whole, you have to accept your intuitions, which are very strong, and your sensitivities. You have to learn to work with them. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to work out very well for you. And I loved him so much. I really felt such rapport for this man. 
I mean, that to me is a secret to healing. I mean, even though I fought him, I was fighting everyone back then. Um, I fought him, but he stuck with me and he taught me and he kept me on the right path. And mm. um, it's just one thing led to another. And then um, I had a dream because he helped me get in touch with all my intuitions and the dreams which are so precious to me. And he, um, I had a dream that told me you're going to become a psychiatrist and go to medical school to have the credentials to legitimize intuition and the empathic abilities into um, the medical realm. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't anything I wanted to do. I was you know, more of a writer and artist and lived working at Pier 1 Imports and living with my boyfriend in Venice Beach and an old converted brick laundromat and my parents were doctors. I just, it it just didn't seem like anything I really wanted to do, honestly. But because I had the dream and I was beginning to trust it, I enrolled in one course when I had dropped out of school, Uh, but I re-enrolled in one course in a uh, community college just to see how it would go. And because it's my destiny, of course, to go down this path, one, one course became two, became 14 years of medical training. And so I got to be a doctor. (laughs) And I got to go through the training of being a physician, which is the most amazing training in the world. You know, just unbelievable learning about the human body and being in surgeries and delivering babies and, you know, all kinds of things you do with people's bodies and souls as a doctor, all the most intimate raw circumstances, which I loved. Um, so anyways, that was my beginning. Uh, it's a, it's a story. It's my life story and it's in second sight. If anyone's interested in reading it and how I incorporate, um, what we're talking about here into mainstream medicine. So I want to pick up on this intuition because one of the chapters that I talk about in my book is about the spirit of empathy. And there's, um, a woman who's from Turkey with a PhD in Islamic art, who now lives and resides in Washington, DC. She does a lot of work on empathy herself. And when I interviewed her a long time ago, I asked her, I said, was there anything about that you learned about Islamic art that informed your thinking about empathy? And she said, absolutely, the shape of a circle. And so just quickly as an aside, um, then to come back to your, your intuition work, she, she said, okay, look, if you think about a circle is an infinite number of dots along the circumference, right? And if you add one more dot or 10 million more dots, the size of the circle just grows. The shape stays the same, but the size grows. And she says, what's interesting about the circle as a metaphor for empathy is that if we consider ourselves like 8 billion people as little dots along the circumference of the circle, and we, we can see that we're all equidistant to the center. So if you think of the center as God or source or whatever gave us life, we're all equidistant. So we're all deserving of the the dignity and the the human, you know, we all deserve to be treated as equals. And yet, even if we're side by side, or even if we're on opposite sides of the circle, we all have different perspectives relative to the center. And I found that such an enormous, like, wow, blew my mind kind of metaphor. And so um, I I see empathy as really important, not only for like creating social change in the world, like we need to care about each other and what's happening to the world so we can create better policies and better social systems. But also I think it's a deeply spiritual thing that we have the capacity to empathize because it's what connects us. So I'm wondering if that's kind of nudging in the direction of intuition. So I guess that's a loaded question to say, tell me more about the connection between empathy and intuition. Um, I think intuition is a form of empathy because when you empathize, you resonate. You're resonating. You're feeling what's going on with another person's experience. Mm. You're aware of it. You're connecting. Connection is key. You're connecting to it. And you're empathizing with it, especially if you're an empath. You're super empathizing with it, maybe too much. Mm. You know, becoming, you jump into the person's skin rather than keeping a, a an appropriate distance from them, which, you know, it's not good to jump in other people's stuff. You'll be exhausted all the time. 
Now you have to learn how to keep a distance and um, you know have some kind of uh, boundaries here. Um, but the intuition is a sense of getting out of your mind and into your gut. And your gut is called the enteric nervous system. It has neurotransmitters in it, just like the brain, which convey information. And you want to know what that information is. So if you just, as a, a point of develop, developing intuition, just tune into your gut, what's going on in there? People get scared of their gut because they have so many symptoms. You know, a lot of sensitive people have a lot of symptoms in their gut. You know, but you want to get to know your gut and you want to listen if something's not right. You know, that simple on in the circle, you know, you want to have, if you feel something's not right in the circle, you want to acknowledge that. I don't feel comfortable standing in this position in the circle, or I don't feel comfortable going into that store. I don't feel comfortable in that business meeting. Something is off about what this person is saying. They're saying all the right things, but why am I getting a stomach ache? You know, you have to begin to incorporate listening to the body as part of your empathic skills. And mm -hmm. so it's not just, oh, this guy is so intelligent. He has such a, you know, well thought out plan. In addition to that, you have to have an embodied life and embodied practice in terms of living if you want all the perceptions coming in. So you have the mind saying that, but you have the, the gut saying, why do I feel nauseous? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> why do I have a knot in my gut? Why do I have um, a sense my energy is being drained when this guy is talking? You know, you want to like him, but like your body's telling you something else, like something else is going on other than what he's presenting, which is so often the case with people. You know, they, they present in a certain way and they want to put on a good face, but then... If you listen with your body, if you listen with your gut, you might get additional information. So certainly that's how I function as a psychiatrist, where I listen to what my patients are telling me. Um, but I also listen for any flashes or intuitions or knowings I get or ahas. And I also listen to what my gut is saying. So there are a lot of other sources of input that I listen to when I'm connecting to somebody, you know, empathically. So it's what I'm doing is encouraging everyone to use all your perceptual abilities. And unfortunately, what can happen in the academic world is people get a lot of reinforcements. They're just living from the neck up. Mm -hmm. So they, they're disembodied heads and they're missing out on so much. And you don't want to stay up here. This, this mind up here, you have to learn how to come into your heart. Because this can cause a lot of problems at 3 a.m. at night when you're worried about something. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't stop. You need to know, have another place to go other than that. That's not going to be your refuge. You can't figure out some things out. You just can't. And as much as you want to, and as much as you want to lie there for three hours trying to figure it out, some you can't approach certain problems on the problem level. So you need to tune into your intuition, which can help. You know, it's, it's, it's just a helper. And it's your best friend. And it's part of being an empath, it's part of being an empathic person is being empathic with yourself. See, I think a lot of times people think, well, I could be empathy, empathy with others. But equally as important, you need to have empathy with yourself because we go through so much all the time. Hmm. All the time. You know, it's a challenging place here. So let's say somebody is, is listening and they're like, hmm. Um, maybe I do pay too much attention to my thoughts and I don't practice enough intuition, but I want to get better at it. So how can we become better at that? Mm -hmm. um, well, I wrote a book called Five Steps to Intuitive Healing, which would be a good guide. You could go through the different five steps. And one step is to listen to your body. Another step is to listen to your dreams and learn to write your dreams down. Um, in the morning, you could ask a question at night and whatever it may be, you know, how can I help my son who's struggling now? And mm -hmm. then you go to sleep and then in the morning you stay in the hypnagogic state between sleep and waking for, a, you know, maybe five minutes. And you just allow any remembrance of the dream to come through without censoring. You can't censor the embarrassing parts or the mm -hmm. anxiety stricken parts. You just can't. It will, it will defeat your purpose. 
So you want to just write down everything and say, how does that answer help me deal with my son? So that's an intuitive technique that you could use dream-wise. And it's something I do every night. I've been done it since I've been a little girl. I keep a dream journal first thing in the morning. I have to get out my journal and write. Before I get up, before I do anything, I write down my dreams. And I, oh, isn't that interesting? You know, isn't that interesting? I'm being chased around a mountain. You know, what could that mean <laughs> In my life, so I, I love the information. I just love it. You know, I love. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Carl Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist who brought dreaming and synchronicities and deja vu's into the into the. Society. He talked a lot about empathy and loneliness, and you know what it was like being in his attic, and you know being an empath and being so sensitive and being so lonely because he didn't connect, you know, just common with empath. Um, mm. So, you know, that's kind of one of my people I go to. I love Carl Young. I didn't even know that about him. Um, okay, so we're, oh my gosh, such a great conversation. We're slowly running out of time, so I want to ask a penultimate question. Um, circling back to the affirmations, can you give us an example of how an affirmation can improve an empath's life. Yes, let me just spontaneously turn to one. I like the spontaneity of it rather than planning. As I pause to reflect on what brings me passion and purpose, I begin to manifest these insights in my life. Mm. So how could it help an empath's life? Let's say you want to find your passion and purpose. Let's say you're a little floundering and let's say you want to go to the next level and the next step. All right, as an empath, I would read this three times a day. As I pause to reflect on what brings me passion and purpose, I begin to manifest these things in my life. That's a very mm -hmm. positive statement. That's what an affirmation is. But in, in this section where you have the writing, you could say, what is in my way? What beliefs are standing in my way of manifesting, you know, the passion and purpose I deserve? Do I have a, you know, my, my father's voice telling me, if you don't go to law school, you're nothing. You know, if you go to art school, it's going to be a big waste of time. You know, if you have that kind of voice, no, but I love art. No, you need to go to law school. And so I've treated so many people gone to law school, you know, in those cases, and it's not right. They have to leave law school usually and go do the art. Um, sometimes they get transformed the law school experience. But my point is that you have early voices that will tell you all kinds of things about their opinions. And if you have narcissistic parents, you know, who just want you to do their bidding and to be the son or daughter that they feel proud bragging about, um, that might stifle you from finding your own path. So it might stifle you from finding your passion and purpose. So even if you have to start over now, I don't care what, what age you are. It doesn't matter to me. But let's say you're in a job and it's not quite right for you. You know, it just doesn't, you're not excited by it. You don't want to really go to work, but you're a, a dedicated person. So you show up. But it's it's boring or it's not, you're not growing. You're not growing. You know, you need to look at that. You know, and that's what this affirmation will help you with. You know, as I pause to reflect on what brings me passion and purpose, I begin to manifest these things in my life. So meaning you have the power, apart from your father's voice, your mother's voice, your whoever else is trying to tell you what to do and what's best for you, which is usually very common. Um, you have to find your own voice. And that's what's so exciting about this. All right, my voice tells me, and then you could do a little picture. It's playful and it's simple. And all of you academic brilliant people out there saying, mm, that's like child's play or something. You know, just go with it. Child's play is good. Being like a child, being simple. I have books that are a lot more complex than this, believe me. But I love the simplicity of this and if you can just surrender a little bit and play i mean this is a book to play with and to be lighthearted with and to really you know write it down like when you were a child remember you would write things down in a journal a lot of you do it again and have it be private and don't have anybody else yeah 
This is a, this is your private stay away journal. Yeah, and I'm imagining instead of doing sort of like a Netflix and chill night where you just, you know, you lose your hour, even if it's a good show, you can invest the time here and think of all of the benefits that would accrue, all the healing and all the affirmations that could manifest some really beautiful changes. That's the point. It's to manifest really beautiful changes no matter how old you are, no matter what your health situation is, no matter what adversity you've gone through in the last couple of years, you know, which is all very, very real. There's time to shift it. There's a, you know, there's a time for all seasons. Yes, we've gone through a very weird and horrible time in a lot of ways, but you have the power to keep going. You don't want to stay stuck in that as if you're traumatized, you know, the trauma of it. You want to, oh, here's a blank page, you know, I think I'll write on it. You know, I think I'll learn about myself from it. I think I'll see where my next direction is. Mm. You see, so that it's fun. I just want to convey a lightness about this particular book. If you want to have more intense books, you can try Thriving as an Empath, which is a daily um, self-care book. Each day is a different day of the year and you can have self-care techniques that help you through everything. And I love the cover of that book. Um, what, what a gift to self and what a gift to give to your friend or your neighbor or your colleague, or, you know, when you get uh, to the end of the year and you do a little uh, secret Santa. Um, Judith, it's been such a pleasure to, to have this conversation with you. I have a final question that I love asking my guests. Uh, for me, it's a treat to hear the answer. And I know that it's probably the thing that, brings me back to new conversations because it's so delicious for me and it affirms so much for me. Um, and that is, the question is, can you think of a time in your life when you were on the receiving end of empathy and what that meant for you? Well, I think with that first psychiatrist, Jim, who you know saw this teenage hippie girl who was so out of control and so belligerent and fighting and sensitive and struggling and involved with drugs and not wanting to cooperate for him seeing me and loving me, you know, through all that and having patience with me and helping me find myself, you know, it's really beautiful. That kind of empathy when, you know, a teenager is fighting, you have empathy for them. It's really beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. So, you know, it makes me want to cry because it's so important, you know, that we give that to one another. And he gave that to me, you know, at a time when I was at war with everybody. So, you know, that that and so many other examples, you know, so many other examples. But, you know, I also want to mention I'm giving a workshop uh, Friday the 19th of August. If you'd like to come, it, it's uh, uh, Zoom. And it's on my website, drjudithorlock.com. It's, I'm going to go over how to use the affirmations book and maybe do some work with individuals, you know, and mentoring work in the workshop. East West Bookstore is putting it on. Um, and it's from 5.30 to 7 Pacific time this coming Friday, August 19th. Fantastic. And I guess suppose upcoming um, talks of that nature will also be on your website. So we can just turn to your website to get, you know, because people will be listening to this, you know, maybe a year from now. So they should yeah. go to your website, judithorloff.com. Is that it? And drjudithorloff.com. Because you earned the, you earned that doctor after 16 years of study. I heard you say it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I sense that you appreciate that psychiatrist having seen you. And I'm sure that you're returning the favor and paying it forward to all the folks that are in your in your uh, office space, but then also who are reading your pages. So thank you on their behalf. You're very welcome. And thank you. For sweet, sweet. Well, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening next week at Purposeful Empathy. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free of your thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from whatever is holding you back? 
At Grand Huron International, you get to choose the coach of your choice anytime from anywhere. Visit grandhuroninternational.ca and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.